In many ways, it's just a sort of symbolism for uh, our vision and our values. Where are we going? What are we, what are we meant to be as a church? We need to work out firstly, what are the things we love? What makes us us? What's our DNA? Seven worship means living your whole life for God, actually giving yourself fully to Him in everything you do, yeah. in your finance, in your time, it, yeah, in singing, in praying, in serving people, just all of your life given over to serving God. Yeah, a worship style of, of living. What we call praise and worship is that kind of just time when you're together corporately, just yeah. to sing it out, say it out. But it's so much more. It's, and I, I heard someone recently saying about how you just you can worship in the in the things that you love. Because everything's created by him. Yeah. So I love the fact that my I have opposing thumbs. You know, these sorts of things are just, wow. He's an amazing God that does all this stuff yeah. and yet chooses to know us. Yeah, for me, worship is about transformation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the big thing is that we can live a life which is totally selfish or yeah. we can live a life for Christ. It's worshipping him. It's, it's all of your attitude, all of your heart, all of your lifestyle given over to serving Christ. Yeah. Amen. Now, when I started off doing the preparation for this, I had a very, very definite idea about what worship lifestyle is, because I'm a worshipper. I like singing, I like praising, I like playing my guitar. I love to stand here on a Sunday and pray and, and sing and, and really worship God. So I was going to deliver a word all about worshipping God on a Sunday morning. And as soon as I started reading the Bible and, and God took me into uh, Kings, and then Deuteronomy, and then Romans, uh, and various different parts of Scripture that we'll cover today. I was absolutely challenged that it was not, not solely, to do with what I've just described. Actually, worship lifestyle, 24-7 worship lifestyle, is so different that I'm actually not going to talk about anything I had initially planned to do which is I'm going to talk about David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into, into the temple and into his, into his palace grounds and worshipping God and standing before God and getting really excited. I'm not going to do any of that. Okay? So, so God, God has had his way already because I just felt it had to be changed. It had to be, what does God mean? What does God mean by 24-7 worship lifestyle? And so it's going to be probably a, a tad different to what you might expect. And that's what I want. I want you to, today, hear stuff that is going to challenge you. And if it doesn't challenge you, it hasn't worked. So as the teacher will see, after class, please see me. If you don't feel challenged after this, please see me. Or Simon, or Andy, because we need to talk. Okay? So let's look at these, these five points. Where does worship originate? What is worship? What is idolatry? Not something you normally put into a worship talk, is it? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to cover idolatry today. Great. Um, where is my heaven? Where's your heaven? We're going to talk about that as well. Because, you know something? We've all got one already. Yeah. And how can we worship? How can we nurture worship in our lives? Um, and this, hopefully, is going to be really challenging. But it's going to be fun as well. Because I, I just love what God's brought to my attention and shown me. Um, so let's, let's go on. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay. Oh, don't you love how they just fade in these things? Right. For me, this is really impressive. Okay, let's, let's just read this out. 
Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. This should be so familiar to many of us. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Just stop at that point. We've read that a million times. Many of us will have read that in Romans. That, yeah, great. Right. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, it doesn't say, go and sing songs on a Sunday morning, lift up your hands, and pray. Now, should you do that? Yes, it's a godly practice. But is it worship on its own? No. Offering your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, is so different. So different. 2 Kings 17, verses 10 to 20. I want you to make a note of them. If you haven't got a pen, um, ask me afterwards. I'll email you the slides. Uh, I'll, you know, because I'm techno like that now. I can email. This is just great. I can be flying in PowerPoint and I can email. I can also make tea. So uh, thank you, James. Thank you very much. But no, no, but I don't wash up. I have dishwasher. God given things. Um, so let's just come back to this. 2 Kings 17 is a real warning in Scripture. Because the Israelites had been led by God um, out of um, a terrible place in Egypt, out of slavery, and had decided that they would worship in the style to which they had chosen, and they had decided is right. So if you like one type of song, or one type of singing, or hymns, or traditional, or modern, or pop, uh, that's great. But be very careful to make sure that it fits in with the Word of God. Where is it? Here we go, again. I brought this Bible, particularly this, it says Holy Bible. This, you know, the Holy Bible. This is where we have to go back to absolute truth, which is what Simon was talking about last week. So important. They decided, the Israelites, bless them, they decided they were going to do it a different way. So they created their own idols. So they had God, God was speaking to them, so they decided they'd add to him, add to his word. This isn't enough, we'll make one of our own. It was tragic. It was tragic. And when you read 10 to 20, it's really scary stuff. How God says, fine, if you're going to be like that, I'm going to turn away from you and leave you to sort out your own lives, and it is going to be awful. It's really terrible. And then Daniel 3, verses 25 to 29, what we're talking about there is... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Wow. Got those names right too. This is great. Rehearsal's always good. Um, <laughs> Sue hasn't seen me for days. The kids have been saying, hallelujah. Dad's in the study again. But Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship any other god except God. And some nasty blokes in the kingdom at that time got persuaded the king to pass a law which said... You have to worship the king. Mm. Yes. And once he passed the law, they then said, these guys don't worship you. And the king actually went into a rage. He went into a rage. And he had these guys thrown into a furnace. But the great thing when you read it, is he wasn't just throw them into a bonfire. He said to his men, he said, go and stoke up the furnace. Make it the hottest it's ever been. So they went off and stoked up this furnace. I can only imagine what this furnace was like, but they stoked it up, stoked it up, stoked it up. And they said, right, get those three guys who don't worship me and throw them in. He said this in a rage. Imagine how angry this guy is. So the, the, it was so hot that the soldiers that were there who bound these guys up, and once you bound them, you can't do a lot of moving, so they had to sort of drag them up to the furnace. The soldiers who dragged them up to the furnace were consumed by the fire. Consumed by the fire, in my language, from Yorkshire, burnt, dead. They were absolutely, it was that hot. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went for a walk in the furnace. By the grace of God, they walked around in the furnace, and it then said that the king and all of his aides saw four people in the furnace. And, and the implication is the Son of God was walking with them. But they came out of the furnace, not even smelling of smoke. And we all know if you go to a, do a garden bonfire on a Sunday afternoon, I can assure you smell of smoke. If you do a barbecue, Andy, you smell of smoke. 
Not all the time, but you smell as well.